Luciano worked closely with the two major old-school Sicilian mob bosses at the time, both located in New York City, Salvatore Maranzano and Joe the Boss Masseria. Unhappy with what he felt were their antiquated ways of doing business, such as only working with associates of Sicilian descent, Luciano felt the old mob bosses were out of touch and were a hindrance to progress and increasing profits through new and different channels. Although Maranzano had been successful at running his empire, he was unable to adapt to the culture and tactics of the new Americanized breed of Italian mobsters. And despite being in America for six years, Maranzano spoke little English and couldn't communicate or relate to the younger generation of criminals, and couldn't comprehend their street talk and slang. Joe the Boss Masseria, Luciano felt, was much too limited in his thinking, refusing to work even with rival Sicilian and Italian gangs, let alone Jewish and Irish mobsters. Lucky's business ideas included streamlining international bootlegging operations, which required cooperation with other Italian and with non-Italian gangs, to bring in greater quantity of booze and eliminate hijackings. A bloody rivalry in New York City in the early 1930s between the two powerful Sicilian godfathers, Maranzano and Masseria, riddled the streets of New York City with dead bodies. Both being from the town of Castellamare del Golfo on the northwest coast of Sicily, this became known as the Castellamarese Wars and helped fuel Luciano's desire for better organization and peace between the families. After 18 months of combat and with no end in sight, this war had to stop. It was bad for business and Lucky knew it. It was time for a changing of the guard. The old bosses had to go. Luciano held a secret meeting with Maranzano to plan the elimination of Joe the Boss Masseria. The plan was set. Lucky invited the boss for a lavish lobster brunch, a card game, and a conference on April 15, 1931 at one of Masseria's favorite restaurants on Coney Island, Nuovo Villa Tomato, where he would feel safe. What would happen next is a textbook mafia-style killing immortalized in the first Godfather movie when Marco Corleone kills Solazzo. The real-life events, however, unfolded a bit differently than as portrayed here, with Luciano excusing himself to go to the bathroom while four of his gunmen came in and shot Joe the Boss dead while he was seated at his table. He died with the Ace of Spades, the death card, still in his hands. What a mess. But the first part was complete. With Masseria eliminated, Luciano focused his sight on eliminating Maranzano and reorganizing operations in New York. Lucky also got word Maranzano was going to have him killed, having already planned for a brutal machine gun assassination of Luciano by the Irish gangster Vincent Mad Dog Cole. So Lucky struck first. He was tipped off that Maranzano was having some financial trouble with the IRS and was expecting to be audited. He also knew Maranzano had instructed his bodyguards to be unarmed when at his office in case the IRS showed up. He did not want any arrests for gun violations. For our next stop, we're going to take a quick ride up to Midtown Manhattan from the East Village to Park Avenue and 46th Street. This building marks a pivotal turning point in the history of the New York Mafia. Lucky's timing was perfect. He had to act quickly to catch Maranzano off guard. So a team of hitmen was assembled. Disguised as IRS agents, said to have consisted of Joe Adonis, Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, and possibly Bugsy Siegel. They stormed Maranzano's office on the ninth floor of the Helmsley building, overlooking Grand Central Terminal here at 230 Park Avenue on September 10th, 1931. And what happens next is not very pretty. Maranzano, his bodyguards and secretary, were lined up at gunpoint with their faces pressed to the wall. Maranzano was then brought into another room where he was then pinned to the wall where they proceeded to stab him four times in the chest, stomach, and face, slicing his mouth and then strangling him. They finally finished off the boss of bosses by firing six bullets into him at close range. 
With Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano dead and the Castella Merese War over, a new age in the Italian-American Mafia had begun. Luciano held a conclave with the heads of four other substantial borgatas in New York who were all agreeable to Lucky's plans and began restructuring the Italian Mafia in New York City. The other bosses were Gaetano Galliano, Vincent Mangano, Joe Bonanno, and Joe Profacci. Out of this meeting in 1931, the five families of New York that still exist today had been set. Luciano's Borgata eventually became the Genovese family, named after Vito Genovese. Gaetano Galliano's Borgata became the Lucchese family, named after Tommy Three Finger Lucchese. Vincent Mangano's family evolved into the Gambino family, named after Carlo Gambino. Joe Bonanno's Borgata remained the Bonanno family, and Joe Profacci's family became the Colombo family, named for Joe Colombo. Luciano also set up what became known as the Commission, the equivalent of a national board of directors that would establish general policies and regulations that all the Mafia families in the country would adhere to. The Commission would be the vital link between the families throughout the country, ensuring cooperation and harmony. It was basically a Supreme Court for the underworld. Next, we head on over to the New York City borough of Queens, to John F. Kennedy International Airport, where the legendary Lufthansa Airlines robbery took place. One New York Mafia family immortalized in one of the best mob films ever made were the Lucchese's. The movie? Martin Scorsese's epic 1990 film, Goodfellas. For this, we head on over to JFK International Airport, where the legendary Lufthansa Airlines robbery took place. The December 11th, 1978 Lufthansa heist, as it is known, was probably the most infamous caper in U.S. history. At John F. Kennedy International Airport, associates of New York City's Lucchese crime family netted nearly $6 million, or $22.5 million today, in cash and jewels. Almost none of the take was recovered, and only one person served time. Three of the key mobsters involved were Jimmy the Gent Burke, Henry Hill, and Tommy DeSimone. In Goodfellas, Jimmy Burke was played by Robert De Niro as Jimmy Conway, Tommy DeSimone was played by Joe Pesci as Tommy DeVito, and Henry Hill was played by Ray Liotta as Henry Hill. Paul Vario played by Paul Sorvino, was the capo who ran the street crew. The entire heist took little more than an hour. However, there was one major screw-up. The getaway driver Parnell Stephen Stax Edwards, played by Samuel L. Jackson in Goodfellas, got drunk and left the van parked illegally on the street in Canossi, Brooklyn, where it was found by police two days later with his fingerprints and footprint in the interior. Burke decided to cut the ties between Edwards and his crew, and the driver became the first suspect in the crime to be murdered. It was Tommy DeSimone, a longtime friend of Edwards, that was given the job. Tommy didn't want to do it. He complained to his boss, Paul Vario, that him and Edwards go back a long ways, and that Tommy was the only person on earth Edwards trusted. But when you're given an order to kill, you don't say no. Tommy went to Edwards' hideout and put five bullets in his skull. Sorry, pal. I hope it didn't hurt. Sooner or later, I'll see you in heaven or hell. Wherever you're going, I'm sure that's where I'll be going. That's exactly what DeSimone said to his friend after murdering him. Tommy soon joined him, 